Okay, um, we'll start on the uh, second session of industrial toxicology or part B of it and we'll start by talking about um, the action that uh, these toxic materials can potentially have on your body and essentially we can break it down into to two types of, of toxic reaction. The first uh, would be what we would classify as an acute exposure and acute effect. And basically what we're referring to when we talk about this, it, it means that you're being exposed <clears throat> to usually a high concentration of the substances, um, primarily over a short period of time. It could be a matter of minutes, it could be hours. Uh, the effects are usually immediate uh, that you see as, as, with respect to the respect of that particular toxin. And um, for the most part, the re effects are going to be reversible. Um, as you can see here, the, uh, the term acutus is a, a Latin term, which basically means, uh, generally meaning high, high levels of exposure occurring for short periods of time. Uh, we usually see this happen when we have accidental spills or uh, pipe breaks or uh, things like that. Uh, it's not something that uh, occurs when we have plan or routine type of work operations. And some of the classical examples of the symptoms that individuals will begin to show from overexposure, acutely being overexposed, are going to be uh, typical things you would expect. Dizziness, headache, maybe uh, irritated uh, respiratory tract system, um, uh, pulmonary edema, in other words, uh, again, a reaction of the pulmonary system. And uh, usually these acute exposures are known for a single one-time type of exposure. The other type of exposures and effects that we can find uh, from uh, industrial exposures are going to be what we would term as a chronic exposure. And what we mean by chronic is something that uh, takes long periods of time, which usually we're being exposed to very low doses, uh, day in, day out week in, week out for months and years. And usually the exposure doesn't result in an immediate effect. And so workers won't really know that um, uh, they're being overexposed because there's no symptomology that, that uh, is showing up. And usually on chronic exposures, oftentimes um, it will be several years down the road before we actually start to see any kind of adverse health effects. And some of those effects can be anywhere from uh, forming cataracts in your eyes to damaging of the uh, liver, kidneys, uh, the respiratory tract system, developing of cancers, and so on. Uh, typically, if we, <clears throat> when we are dealing with uh, chronic ty type of exposures, this is where the industrial hygiene uh, specialist needs to go out and do air monitoring to determine what levels are uh, present and compare them with acceptable exposure level, levels that have been established for those compounds to see if uh, there is exposure uh, occurring. Now oftentimes what we'll do with chronic exposures, we'll have what we refer to as a latency period. And the latency period simply means it's a time period between when the exposure occurs and the development of the actual symptoms. And one of the, the best documented examples uh, that we have of this are asbestos and the uh, diseases associated with uh, chronic asbestos exposures. Those respiratory tract um, cancers and asbestosis and, and uh, uh, mesothelioma and so on, they don't show up for 20 or 30 years after exposure. And so the individual worker doesn't really notice that um, they're being overexposed until once they do show up, oftentimes on chronic exposures with these latency periods, that once the signs and symptoms do appear, uh, we'll, we usually find that they're irreversible, uh, that they can't, we can't correct the damage they do. Another example, classical example that we've had in the industrial setting is the formation of leukemia uh, from uh, workers who were exposed to benzene. Now, um, <clears throat> oftentimes we, we have to end up, we talked about uh, in toxicology, how we frequently have to use retrospective studies. And um, uh, this is an example of chronic exposures where we've had to use these retrospective studies that um, we see workers in a particular industry uh, 
start developing these ad adverse health effects. And by that time, it's too late to do anything about it. Well, there are several factors that can influence a toxic effect of a material, and first and foremost is certainly going to be the concentration of material uh, that an individual is being exposed to. How frequency, how, or how frequent are they being exposed? How long a time period are they being exposed? All of those things will have a bearing uh, uh, of determining the overall effect uh, that toxic substance has on an individual worker. Another key uh, factor is going to be the roots of exposure, whether it's uh, inhalation, ingestion, in injection, or um, uh, skin contact, uh, what we've previously mentioned. And then you also have interspecies and intraspecies variation. Um, uh, different uh, individuals are, are going to react differently, male versus female. Uh, genetically, you can uh, uh, respond uh, differently uh, to certain chemical exposures, and you have to factor those, uh, those issues into the overall toxic effect the individual is going to have. And then you have environmental factors, uh, just the environmental conditions around, whether we're dealing in hot environments, cold environments, um, and the impact of, of those environmental conditions on uh, the overall exposure that a worker will have. And then finally, a key uh, factor on the toxic effect is going to be are we, are we also ex being exposed to other chemicals that uh, combined they can have an uh, impact on us as well, where one individual uh, chemical will do a certain level of damage. If we add a second one, it can um, uh, be twice as dangerous or, in some cases, uh, several times more dangerous. Uh, when we look at interspecies variation, we're talking here about age and maturity. Again, we talked a little bit about how um, uh, young children's body organs are not fully developed and, and uh, as a result of that, if they were being exposed to certain types of chemicals, uh, their body organs can't handle it or can't metabolize those chemicals the same way a mature adult's body organs can, uh, can deal with it. And so um, the more mature the, the um, uh, worker is and uh, develop, um, uh, physically uh, uh, developed, um, the, the uh, different uh, response that they could pen potentially have. And, and not only how the young can respond differently, but the, the elderly can. If people have been working for 40 or 50 years and their body has continuously been uh, exposed to toxic substance, damage could have resulted in, and, um, and do little bits of damage as they get older, then their bodies uh, cannot handle you know, those toxic effects, uh, toxic exposures as well. Uh, we'd mentioned gender, hormonal status, uh, genetic makeup, uh, ethnic makeup. And then also, uh, an interspecies variation is going to uh, depend on the individual's uh, state of the health. Uh, is the person that we're uh, worker in, in good general health, or uh, are they uh, in poor health, overweight, or don't uh, have good diets, or smokers, and so on, can all be contributors. We talked about chemical combinations. When you're exposed to one individual chemical, it can do a certain type of damage. Um, I mentioned um, uh, that when you're exposed to a second chemical, uh, it can be twice as dangerous, but sometimes it can be even um, more severe of a, of a hazard to us. And um, chemicals that fall into this range, we say that the individual is going to have a synergistic effect. In other words, uh, I'm exposed to chemical A for, um, and it can produce a certain type of damage in and by itself. And then I turn around and I can be exposed to chemical B in and by itself, it can do a certain level of damage. But when I'm exposed to both A and B, it's not an additive effect, it's a multiplicative effect. And then the, those types of chemicals, we say, have a synergistic reaction. Uh, the best documented example we have of this, as we said before, is asbestos and cigarette smoking. Studies have uh, clearly shown that uh, do each one of those activities uh, or have exposures independently, and they'll ha have a certain potential damage it can do on the body, but when you do them together, uh, 
the studies have shown it can be anywhere from 80 to 200 times more dangerous. And then we have a condition called potentiation. And potentiation essentially means when I have a chemical A, it can do a certain type of damage to us. Um, and then chemical B, <clears throat> it's relatively non-toxic, won't have much of an effect um, unless the dosage is high enough. Uh, but when uh, you're ex exposed to both chemical A and B, chemical B causes the uh, adverse health effects of chemical A to be much more dangerous. And it's, uh, again, somewhat similar to synergistic. Uh, it causes it to be, uh, the reaction to be uh, more intensified. And um, an example we used to have of this when I was in the Air Force is we used to use a cleaning solvent called trichloroethylene or TCE, which is in, in and on its own a central nervous system depressant. Um, and what would, we would find is that workers who worked with these solvents would, uh, in the Air Force and the military, they would go out after work and go to a bar and have one or two uh, beers and normally, if they hadn't been exposed to TCE, those one or two beers wouldn't have an effect. But because they were exposed to that TCE, that central nervous system depressant, it caused having simply that one or two beers, the individual would come completely drunk um, and overwhelmed by the toxic effects. So uh, that ex was an example of potentiation. And then you can have compounds that we refer to as antagonists. And what we refer, mean here is that given chemical A, it can ca cause a certain type of damage. And then when we're exposed to chemical B, it can cause a certain level of damage. But when I'm exposed to A and B together, they negate or they cancel out the toxic effects that each one has. <clears throat> and the go best documented example we have of this is lead exposure and EDTA, which EDTA is a chelating agent that we use to counteract exposures to lead. So in, the, in that sense, we, um, it was beneficial. Well, remember we talked about concentrations and uh, we want to remember our units of measurement. When we're talking about uh, gases and vapors and dusts and fumes and mists, for the most part, the units of measurement that are going to be used are going to be milligrams per of the substance um, uh, per cubic meter of air. Um, if the quantity is very low, we could also use micrograms per cubic meter of air, or even in some cases you may see the term nanogram. Again, that's a, uh, several orders of magnitude less than what we would see with milligrams per cubic meter. And then the other uh, unit of measurement we see is going to be in parts per million. And, uh, Essentially, the concept of parts per million is, is uh, uh, parts, uh, molecules of that particular substance per million parts of air. And the concept is the same as, as anything. If we said one inch and 16 miles, that's as theoretically is equated to one part per million. Or if we had one minute and two years, would be part per million. Um, but again, if the concentration is real low, we can go down... Uh, and see the concentration recorded in parts per billion. And um, again, this is another factor of, of a thousand uh, uh, smaller in quantity than parts per million. A lot of people um, uh, think that just because of the term billion in the word, uh, that it's a higher number. It's not. It's uh, uh, looking at the whole term, it's parts of the contaminant per billion parts of air. So it's a very, very small amount of material. And then you could also, in some cases, rarely, but you could see um, a, a concentration expressed as parts per trillion. Well, when we look at the toxicity of materials, one of the things that uh, the toxicologist uses to try to determine whether a material is toxic or how toxic it might be and, uh, and, and they state they do it by, by studying what are the chances that um, uh, death would occur uh, amongst somebody by one part per million or their life expectancy would be reduced by uh, eight minutes. And uh, some of the concepts uh, that you see here in, in discussing those, those concepts of parts per million. Uh, smoking 1.4 cigarettes or living two months with a cigarette smoker, uh, 
eating 100 charred broiled steaks. You can go down the list and see uh, what certain compounds would correlate with an increase of uh, individuals' death uh, by one part per million. Well, whenever we have our contaminants, um, they can enter our body through our four routes of entry that we've discussed, ingestion, inhalation, injection, and uh, uh, skin contact. Um, the, the contaminants can do a number of different things, uh, again, depending how it enters into the body. Um, if it enters uh, in through ingestion, it's basically going to, you can see on the left side of our screen here, uh, the contaminant uh, faith is going to go down into the uh, gastrointestinal system and then could eventually be uh, excreted uh, through the feces. Or it can get into the, um, the stomach and, and uh, be processed then down through the, by passing through the blood and the lymph systems into the liver and from the liver transported to other um, areas of the body. Um, again, we can see here inhalation. Uh, again, the inhalation goes into the lungs and go down into the various uh, systems in the body. The body eventually wants to deal, do two things with it. It either wants to treat it or counteract it by doing some kind of metabolic uh, change of the uh, foreign substance that's coming into the body, or it wants to get rid of it and expel it, and it can expel it either through the breathing air um, or uh, through feces or urine. Uh, but it wants to get it out of the body. If it doesn't, then it can go in and do uh, potential damage to our, our bodies. Well, here's some charts of, uh, that just give some illustrations of different types of chemicals. We can see here we've got ammonia, formaldehyde, ozone, and phosgene and some of the um, effects that they will have at varying concentrations. Um, you can see some of them, uh, very low exposures will cause um, um, an individual to response, and the response can, and for the most part, uh, be correlated with, a, with some form of res respiratory distress or damage, um, but some of the materials are more toxic and, as this uh, table shows than, than others. Um, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the effects to, um, these chemical substances can have on the body system. We're gonna start with the uh, first, the basic one is that a chemical can be an asphyxiant. And, and basically what we mean by an asphyxiant, it's a compound that's capable of uh, starving the body of oxygen, and uh, it can be done in, in, uh, in two ways. Uh, you can have some, uh, what is referred to as a simple asphyxiant, and that's a compound that basically what it's doing is it's displacing the oxygen uh, in air available to the body system. Um, so it's starving the body from, uh, from the oxygen that it normally needs uh, to function. Those are simple asphyxiants, so it's, they're displacing the oxygen availability. Um, on the other hand, you can have sub compounds that we refer to as chemical asphyxiants, and a chemical asphyxiant is going to be one of those compounds that the actual chemical uh, goes in and um, uh, chemically prevents the body from uh, carrying oxygen throughout the, the uh, the body, the, the delivery system, the blood and everything, and uh, delivering it to the locations in the body that need that oxygen supply. And a good example of a chemical asphyxiant is going to be like carbon monoxide, where uh, one of the key components of the oxygen carrying capacity in the, rest in the body is going to be the hemoglobin in the blood. Well, oxygen by, uh, attaches onto that hemoglobin and as that hemoglobin in the blood is transported throughout the body system, it's dumped off in areas where the body needs it. Well, carbon monoxide has a higher affinity for that hemoglobin in the blood. And so what it'll do is it'll knock the oxygen out of the way and it'll bind to that hemoglobin and uh, therefore the body becomes starved of that oxygen that it needs to, to live. And so that's an example uh, 
of a chemical asphyxiant. Another example of a compound uh, that can cause that type of chemical asphyxiation is methylene chloride. Methylene chloride is a common solvent that's used and one of the unique things about it is when it goes into the body, the body metabolizes methylene chloride or breaks it down and one of the byproducts that's produced is carbon monoxide. So um, individuals that are exposed to methylene chloride can end up with uh, carboxyhemoglobin, uh, which is um, essentially the carbon monoxide starving the, the uh, hemoglobin from its ability to uh, carry oxygen, through, oxygen to the body. <clears throat> um, so, uh, si simply put is that a simple asphyxiant is physiologically like an inert gas and it's just going to displace the oxygen where the chemical asphyxiant is where substances will come in and chemically bind to the body's oxygen comparing, uh, carrying or um, organs or uh, hemoglobin and, and prevent it from being transported in the body. And here's a list of some of our simple asphyxiants that are very common to be found in the in, uh, workplace. So methane, ethane, uh, the helium, hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, a lot of these are inert gases, um, but they can displace the oxygen and therefore cause starvation of oxygen to the, uh, to the worker. And then the examples of chemical asphyxiants, you can see here carbon monoxide, a couple of others, hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen cyanide. Well, one of the things that um, uh, toxic effects that chemicals can produce on the human is uh, a central nervous system depressant. And basically, central nervous system depressants interfere with uh, the brain, the spinal cord functions, and they're going to have more of an anesthetic type of response to the body. Um, and the higher and the more severe the uh, exposure is, then the more uh, damage it can do to that uh, central nervous system. Some examples of um, some of the volatile organic compounds that can result in uh, CNS depression are going to be like your alcohols, ethanol, propanol, ketones, uh, acetone, methyl ethyl ketone, a couple of very common solvents, um, ethyl ether and isopropyl ether. Um, well, many of you have gone in for any kind of surgery that they've used. Anesthetics, that's basically what it's doing. An anesthetic is uh, you're being administered under controlled conditions. Um, those uh, compounds that can cause an impact on the central nervous system. But some of your aromatic substances, benzene, toluene, xylene, and then halogenated hydrocarbons, uh, trichloroethylene, perchloroethylene, and so on. All of these things are central nervous system depressants. Um, then we can have neurotoxins, and what we refer to as neurotoxins are those uh, chemical compounds uh, that can <clears throat> affect the nervous system. And, um, and some of the compounds uh, that have been documented of causing these kind of effects, these neurotoxic effects, are things like lead and mercury, and magnesium. In fact, if you go back <clears throat> into um, the English uh, documentation in the 1800s, you'll see where one of the compounds that was used in the felt hat industry to cure the, the felts was mercury and the workers would take mercury and rub it on the felt hats. And mercury <clears throat> was, is capable of being absorbed fairly readily into the, into the blood st uh, stream. And it is, is a well-documented neurotoxin and essentially makes um, overexposure can result in individuals going crazy. So if you've ever uh, recall the, the uh, story Alice in Wonderland, um, where it talks about the Mad Hatter. Uh, that's where that uh, uh, individual character was originated from because many of the people working in the felt hat industry would literally go crazy from being exposed to uh, excessive amounts of mercury. <clears throat> 
You can also see here, uh, talking about a, um, a professor at Dartmouth who died uh, in less than a year, and uh, uh, he had been uh, doing work with uh, organometallic compounds, and uh, again found extremely high levels of metal, uh, the mercury in his blood system, and uh, ultimately resulted in death. Um, and then finally, the, uh, many of your uh, pesticides that we see or can, can encounter um, can be a, a neurotoxin. And uh, you can see a couple of parathion and califoram uh, or carboforans are just a couple of examples of those uh, toxic um, neurotoxins. And if we look generally a schematic of the body's nervous system, uh, we see it here. You've got the brain and uh, you've got various nerve endings and neurons and synapses structures that come out from the brain. It also goes down into the uh, spinal cordal system and these are the things that can be impacted by those neurotoxins. Then we can have substances which we refer to as uh, hepatotoxin. Hepatotoxin are basically uh, those chemical substances that are going to be capable of causing damage to the liver. Um, and basically, if to understand the liver is a major processing plant uh, that your body has, and pretty much uh, blood passes through the, the liver and the, the liver tries to detoxify uh, that blood system from any harmful substances that it encounters. And, and that detoxification can either change or metabolize the substance into something that's non-toxic and it can pass out through the body. Or in some cases, it can change the compound into something that's more toxic uh, to the uh, human system. And as a result, ultimately go through and cause damage to the body. There's a variety of compounds that are, are hepatotoxins. Um, you can see here some of the uh, liver toxins that are listed, beryllium, carbon tetrachloride, chloroform, ethanol, phosphorus, uh, tetrachloroethane, vinyl chloride. Many of your, many of your solvents that will, uh, you know, workers will use <clears throat> in the course of doing work um, are going to be considered as uh, uh, hepatotoxins or capable of causing damage to the, to the liver. And again, looking at the liver, this is just a cross-sectional diagram uh, that shows the functioning of the liver and how uh, you have a variety of tubules down there and they go through a filtering system in various zones and, and um, that the liver function is basically two things and is to either change compounds into something useful for the body or uh, change it into something that's non-toxic and pass it out of the body. But keeping in mind, sometimes it uh, gets changed into something that can do damage to the body. Well, the other or organ that we uh, see in humans that is a processing plant, if you will, is gonna be the kidneys. And we have a number of compounds, many of which cause damage to the liver, will also cause damage to the kidneys. Um, those compounds are referred to as nephrotoxins, and uh, uh, <coughs> um, what the uh, kidneys try to do when uh, substances come through, they again will, will either try to process it and get rid of it out of the body, um, or change it into other molecules, um, and, and hopefully be um, something useful for the body, but many times they're changed into molecules that can be absorbed into the body and, and cause toxic effect. And some of our examples of common compounds that are, are documented kidney or nephrotoxins are gonna be your lead, mercury, cadmium, chloroform, uh, ethylene glycol, just to name just a few. Again, the cross-sectional cross diag diagram of the, of the kidney nephron structure uh, is shown here. I think this is all, um, there's also uh, illustrated in your textbook uh, the various components or sections of the, of the kidney where um, compounds travel through uh, 
during the uh, uh, travel through the blood system. Then we can have certain compounds that we refer to as um, cardiac uh, sensitizers or things that can impact the heart. Um, a lot, again, are going to be solvents, volatile organic compounds that can uh, have an impact on, on the proper function and sens sensitivity of the, of the heart. It can cause it to go into defibrillation or um, it can cause certain chemicals, adrenalines, to be produced and, and uh, the, it's sen it's, uh, the body senses it. Uh, as a cardiac failure or, or um, ventricular um, arrhythmias can, uh, can occur. And then of course we have our respiratory tract or pulmonary tract um, hazards <coughs> that can damage the respiratory tract system. We looked at the, um, the uh, anatomy of the respiratory tract in the first session of this lecture and we saw that uh, pretty much when we inhale, any contaminant or anything that's contained in the air is going to be brought into the <coughs> various regions of the respiratory tract and they'll either um, be exhaled or they'll remain into the lung systems uh, and can be deposited there. Um, and once they're deposited, they can either do nothing or they can cause damage or do both. Um, or in some cases for gases and vapors, the um, uh, toxic substances can pass right through the respiratory tract into the blood system and be carried throughout uh, the other <coughs> biological systems we just discussed. <coughs> some examples of uh, pulmonary hazards that have been well documented. The first is silicosis, um, which is a, a scarring of the uh, deepest regions of the uh, respiratory tract down in the alveoli. Um, silicosis is a progressive fibrotic producing uh, hazard where um, once that scarring starts taking place and it's being caused by crystalline free silica or quartz, then uh, it will continue to develop and grow and, um, and people usually die uh, after uh, a very short time of exposure periods. It can be, they can die from silicosis within five to ten years of exposure. And then we have asbestosis. Um, some of the uh, uh, conditions that can uh, result from um, asbestos exposure, it's going to um, either be asbestosis, which is just scarring of the respiratory tract system, the lungs, and because of that scar tissue forming in those deep regions of the alveoli area, uh, oxygen exchange can't take place down in those regions. As a result of that, <clears throat> the heart starts working harder because they're not getting enough oxygen transported across the uh, membrane into the blood system. And eventually what people do is will die of heart failure if they um, have serious conditions of asbestosis. And then asbestos can also cause an actual lung tumor, or lung cancer, um, which is a tumor growth. And um, it can also cause mesothelioma, which is a cancer of the lining of the respiratory tract and the abdominal system. And then we have things like beryllium, um, and beryllium is a suspect uh, cancer-causing substances, although studies are still out on it um, uh, causing cancer, but it does cause other uh, ailments in the respiratory system. <coughs> Arsenic can cause lung cancer. Benzene uh, is docu well documented causing leukemia and aplastic anemia. Uh, cadmium is uh, again a kidney, can cause a kidney and uh, damage as well as lung and prostate cancers. And of course, you have a variety of different dusts that can cause uh, respiratory distress to the um, exposed individual. Well, let's talk a little bit about neoplasms, reproductive toxins, or in other words, uh, essentially um, uh, abnormal growth in the, in the body system, which were referred to as neoplasms. Um, and first and foremost, the of concern is certainly those substances that are capable of causing cancer. Uh, 
uh, referred to as carcinogens. Um, and a, a cancer-causing substance is, is basically going to result in abnormal cell growth, and that can occur very, uh, very or various organs throughout the body, and uh, <clears throat> can result in uh, tumors and and uh, uh, blastoma germs and and um, and oncogens, which are all just various forms of uh, cancers that can be formed. <clears throat> so if we look at the definition of uh, a carcinogen, the substance that will induce a malignant tumor in humans following some kind of a, an exposure, and a substance that will induce neoplastic new or abnormal growth in any tissue of animals at any dose by any method of application applied as long as a normal lifetime, and it can be defined as a substance that produces cancers in two or more animals. So those are all used to by various groups to define what a carcinogen is. Here's a list of a variety of carcinogens. Uh, again, um, uh, there's, there's countless hundreds and hundreds of compounds that have been documented of, of either known to cause cancers in humans or are suspect of causing cancers. We see here in the list the common things, coal tars, creosote oils, um, waxes and paraffins, arsenic compounds, uh, some of your chromium and nickel compounds, which are very common to be found in stainless steel welding operations, so we have to be aware of those. Uh, you can also have, besides chemicals, you can have physical hazards result in the formation of carcinogens, and, and uh, ionizing radiation is one of those, um, and then benzene. Uh, uh, both of those things are documented of being able to cause leukemia. And then you have mycotoxins such as the aflatoxin, um, trichothecenes, um, we got vinyl chloride and its ability to cause angiosarcomas, which is a rare type of a liver cancer. And um, you know, we have uh, bischloromethyl ether, um, which uh, causes oat cell carcinomas in the lungs again from inhalation or absorption. <clears throat> when we look at the um, uh, reproductive hazards, um, there's a few terms that you'll see used in the reproductive hazards, and one of them is uh, a mutagen. And basically, a mutagenic material uh, is going to affect the gene genetic uh, material uh, makeup of the person that's being exposed and that person may or may not have an adverse um, response show up. More often what will happen was the, the host will not show the adverse response, but the offspring or the children uh, from uh, the individual who's been exposed will um, form those adverse uh, health effects. And they can be many from uh, missing of limbs to, uh, to a, quite a bit of deformity uh, in the offspring of people who have been exposed to mutagens. Um, there's usually quite a long uh, latency period associated with mutagens and uh, as a result of that it's been fairly difficult for uh, scientists to to track it because somebody can be exposed to that mutagenic material uh, for a number of years and then they not be exposed to it uh, after that for many, many years, but the genetic damage that was caused during the exposure period has already happened. And, um, and so then subsequently down the road when they have offspring, um, then they'll have these abnormalities. And again, uh, the reproductive Toxic effects you can see are, are uh, a variety, varied, depending on what the compound is. Um, then we can also have materials which are referred to as teratogens. Now, teratogens are those chemical substances that are actually going to go and destroy or damage, do damage to the fetus during its developmental stage. 
So it's not going to cause the genetic structure damage that we see in, uh, in the host, uh, the mother or the father. It's going to actually, a teratogen is going to go actually affect directly um, the feces. And oftentimes if you have uh, women who are working in areas where teratogens are known to be used, uh, companies will make sure that they remove a, a, a female worker from that area of exposure or potential exposure during um, the pregnancy cycle uh, to make sure that, uh, that the, there is no harm done to the fetus during that developmental stage. <clears throat> you can see here some examples such things as uh, the infections such as uh, rubella, metals, and lead and mercury, uh, some of the chemicals, ionizing radiation, or, or uh, suspect teratogens. Again, they're affecting, those are the things that are affecting the fetus and not necessarily the mother. Um, which brings us to a question of, of can you really remove somebody from a working condition uh, from working around these uh, chemical substances and uh, there's been some legal cases which um, have stood up that uh, allow employers to remove um, pregnant females from, uh, from exposures um, and uh, anybody who is trying to reduce or eliminate anybody who is potentially in that fertile stage from working in, around those uh, situations. Well, <clears throat> We talked about, um, uh, last time we talked about occupational exposure limits and how they're established and, and basically um, uh, that's what this toxicology session leads us up to. Is this, uh, we know that the chemical compounds um, can cause a uh, potential toxic effect if the exposure concentration, the time of exposure is sufficient to cause physical harm. Um, so what we want to do is we want to establish exposure limits. And, and since we don't have toxicology studies for all compounds, one of the things that we do and see done more in industrial hygiene toxicology is we're, we're making assumptions that anytime we're dealing with structurally similar chemicals is that we want to suspect, and oftentimes we do find, that they will have uh, similar uh, toxic responses to humans. Here's just another, another example of, of um, uh, chemical uh, formulas for, for uh, toluene and xylene. They're very similar, you can see here in structure. Um, and if we looked at their uh, toxic properties, we would see uh, they'd be likewise very similar. We would mentioned during the occupational exposure uh, limits uh, lecture, about different types of studies that we use to try to determine is something toxic or not. Um, and we can either, most commonly we use animal studies to do that uh, simply because it's hard to get humans to volunteer <coughs> to participate in these studies when we're trying to figure out what a toxic response is going to be. And so we use animal studies. Um, there are some pros and cons about doing animal studies. Uh, none, none of which um, trying to find the right um, species uh, to illustrate the response that we're looking at or the toxicologist is looking for. And so those organs and those um, organisms have to respond somewhat similar to what a, a human's organism will be. And we then <clears throat> bring in the um, animals and set up the experiments and we can do those experiments either, again, if we're looking at acute effects or chronic effects. Uh, will depend on the time period and the dosage that's being administered. Um, acute effects are, <clears throat> are going to be at high concentrations. We'll watch the immediate response. Well, those chronic effects, we may expose the animal for uh, half their normal life period or three-fourths of their uh, normal life period which could be in months and sometimes years. And then uh, we, we kill the animal and look at the various body organs and see what responses can, can occur. Oftentimes these studies are looking for um, 
the formation of car um, cancer tumors, um, teratogen or teratogenic effects or mutagenic effects. <coughs> Obviously, our, um, there is uh, some pitfalls in trying to use the animal studies um, and these experimental, and this experimental data and trying to extrapolate it to say, you know, um, how does feeding something of five milligrams per kilogram to an animal correlate to 30 parts per million of inhalation studies to a human? And, and it is very difficult to do. And, um, but it's the best system we have available to us uh, right now in trying to determine. Um, obviously, the human epidemiological studies like we talked about last time are are more in the retrospective studies where we go and we see um, certain disease trends that have happened in a large population or a particular uh, industry. Um, and um, for example, like vinyl chloride, um, it was discovered the dangers of vinyl chloride exposures in the vinyl chloride manufacturing um, industry uh, where <clears throat> They were using large quantities of vinyl chloride to make polyvinyl chloride products. And so there was a high incidence of, of cancers in that working population. And as a result, they went back then, or studied retrospectively, and found out, yeah, in fact, vinyl chloride can cause uh, uh, cancers. And uh, so those are retrospective studies. You can also have prospective studies which we're essentially doing is, is collecting current data and um, trying to uh, extrapolate that data into uh, uh, toxic effects. Uh, some of the examples of, of uh, retrospective studies that have been going on and are in some cases still going on, um, the study of beryllium and, uh, in the 40s and the 50s and um, uh, there's literally thousands of uh, bits of data out there that shows exposures and, and concentration of exposures and, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and trying to see from that data what, um, what adverse health effects are workers who are working with beryllium um, having. And, um, that's long been that uh, trying to make an association with uh, beryllium causing cancers, although they've, they've not been able to do that unequivocally. And so studies are still going on, and we'll talk about one of them in a minute. But asbestos, that's how we, uh, we looked at retrospective studies for asbestos, um, where the asbestos industry actually knew or had the data that showed that uh, workers in the shipbuilding and shipyards and everything were developing <clears throat> um, asbestosis and lung cancer and mesothelioma. And uh, one of the problems that, that uh, in, in those exposures occurred from the insulation that was used in, in piping thermal system insulation. So the asbestos materials were very friable. The workers would go in there and they'd replace the insulation, put new insulation on you would have uh, millions of particles, millions of fibers uh, produced in the air. These workers would uh, inhale. Well, <clears throat> they had uh, the um, medical teams for the producers of these asbestos products had this medical data on the hazards of asbestos and um, actually uh, did not reveal the data. And, uh, um, as a result of that hiding of that data, they didn't let people know about the hazards associated with asbestos, and so uh, millions of people uh, developed these asbestos uh, illnesses. As a result of that, John Mansville, which was one of the biggest producers of these asbestos-containing uh, products, was um, uh, sued in class action suit, and you still see payments uh, being made to people who are um, being uh, or who were exposed to asbestos and had de since developed uh, these asbestos diseases. Uh, when we talk about asbestos, um, 
We talked to units of measurement earlier, parts per million, milligrams per cubic meter. Asbestos is one of those compounds where we use a different unit of measurement in, uh, for asbestos. What we refer to of the unit of measurement is fibers of asbestos per cubic centimeter of air. So it's fibers per cc as the unit of measurement. And as I mentioned, um, <clears throat> uh, Brush Wellman, uh, who is the big manufacturer of beryllium um, that's used in a variety of products, especially in the military um, and, and metal, um, metallurgic type of work. Uh, it, Brush Wellman uh, has a plant in Elmore, Ohio, as well as Tucson, Arizona. And they continuously collect data, exposure data, and uh, work congruently or concurrently with NIOSH and uh, <clears throat> try to uh, uh, make sense of that data and, uh, and come to conclusions of what uh, the health effects are uh, with respect to uh, beryllium exposures. And so that's a current retros a prospective study that is actually um, going on. So that ends our uh, lecture on uh, toxicology. Um, <clears throat> next week, <clears throat> we'll get into talking about <clears throat> um, uh, basic um, science, um, chemistry, <clears throat> and some industrial hygiene chemistry and start getting into some of the um, uh, chemistry calculations for next week. You also have a um, project. Uh, on industrial toxicology, which you can now be working on. So um, <clears throat> um, you've got uh, two or three projects that you should have or be in the process of uh, completing. And um, again, when you get those projects uh, completed, as soon as you do, get them submitted into the Blackboard system and I'll get them graded as quickly as possible so you can uh, see how you did on the projects. And um, we can also send you answer keys if you miss something on the project. You want to know exactly what it was that you missed. We'll send you answer keys so you can figure that out. So with that, we'll conclude our lecture on toxicology. <laughs>